And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the Valley of the Judged. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have my good brother here in the temple. The man of a thousand runes, the CEO of Zadari Enterprises, and the, and the bane of my fucking existence, good brother Xanatrix. And I introduced him to the Colossus from Ruby today. He is suitably scarred. I'm not suitably scarred, I'm pissed off. Although, given what we're going to be tackling on Sunday, this is, um... Apropos? Ap yes. <laughs> yes, let's go with that. <laughs> Alrighty. But... We are, t we are tackling... Uh, this week, we are tackling another class from Heavens and Heresies. This class is a mysterious bunch... No one knows who they are or what they were doing. But we do know that they all have an attitude. Because their mystery is a mystery for me and you. <laughs> just just let him get it out of his system, everybody. He'll, he'll return to normal eventually. Yes, we are, ta we are tackling... Uh, we're tackling the mystery of the Druids. <laughs> the mystery of the Druids. <laughs> Come on, I had to. <laughs> yes, yes you did. <laughs> and yet you still wouldn't let me sing Be a Monk. Beca because... 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 Because you would have gone through the full song. No, I would have picked out the best part of the first verse. Bullshit! And then the refrain, and that's really it. Second verse, same as the first. You would try and, you would try and drag it as long as possible to maximize my suffering. Boondock Saints. Seriously. You deserve that. Yes, I did. Seriously, you must listen to that song religiously. <laughs> Get it. But yes, we are tackling druids this time. And this is going to be an interesting one because this is our first proper casting class. And a full caster at that. Or mm -hmm. at least a full caster in basic D&D. I don't know if there is such a thing as a full caster or half caster in heavens and heresies and it doesn't seem like there's going to be that sort of distinction the vibe that i've been getting thus far is that you're either a caster or you're not and but, i'm but, perfectly but you can go ahead i was gonna say with feats you can still be a wizard with a great sword on the front line oh you can oh, oh feats notwithstanding but i get the i get the feeling that um there isn't really there isn't really much of a half caster kind kind of thing, um, asi yeah. aside from that, and I'm f I'm fine with that for one very specific reason. More often more often than not, half casters end up end up um end up end up having the issue of, hey I can hey I can do this and so and something else, but I'm not very good at either compared compared to somebody who's more focused. And or they're. Or they are the uh, the focus of our of our well, at least half the focus of our class focus today. They're either Cod or Zilla. Codzilla. Mm hmm Which I know it's been a while since we went into that. We should we should um I think we I think it's something that we should that we should go, that we should um return to for a for a bit to kind of get everyone up to speed. So Codzilla is a infamous is is a um infamous bit of discourse regarding regarding character builds and the optimization therein. The cod is shorthand for cleric or druid. This is in reference to the fact that um, both of these classes, especially in the especially in the 3rd edition days, um were no were notoriously over useful, not necessarily overpowered, although they, although they certainly were. They, it's more the fact that somebody who knew what they were doing when optimizing a cleric or a druid build 
could break your game. Um, Same with mm-hmm. let's let's just let's, with the cleric. It was pretty simple. You could put a cleric in heavy armor and give them a mace if you really wanted to, and they'd be fully effective. Mm-hmm. Then, of course, all their divine spells. I'm sorry, you're just a fighter that is literally better in every way. What? Yeah. Um, now, granted, this. Now, granted, Godzilla is not the only offender of this kind of playing D and D on easy mode kind of thing. There was the wizard erudite multi-class. The um, some of the artificer builds, the archivist build could get could get could get real bad, or the beholder mage. No, where you know. Knows every spell, gets a large number of spells per day, and can cast ten spells per round simultaneously. Or yeah. The... Or just dick punch you as a bear. Mm-hmm. Or the Ilfid Savant. <laughs> we don't get into race... into, into monster races and, and there's... <clears throat> Dumb fucking classes. Mm-hmm. Illithid Savant can suck my left testicle. No, um, wait. Keep those things away from me. I don't want them. And um, let's let's not for, let's not forget pun pun. Ah, the great thought experiment, the most broken thing ever. Want a character with literally infinity stat points? Go look up pun pun the magic kobold. <laughs> yeah, but um. But there's, and of, co- of course, of course, there's the f- there's the fact that um, as we as we mentioned, the fa- the big the big problem when the big problem when it comes to the cleric and the druid, is that D and D as a cl- as a cl- as a class centric game, is hyper focused on each cl- on each class being some sort of specialist in a respect in a respective field and and these the countermeasures that is some if somebody wants to sp- try and try and be in multiple fields there go- there's going to be penalties for that kind of thing um, which is a reasonable thing on paper the druid and the cleric have have the problem of they can do multiple things and they can do mul- they can do multiple things and they can do them well. For inst- so, you need you need somebody to be a caster. Druids are, Druids already come with divine magic out of the gate. You need you need you need a front you need a frontliner wild sh- wild shape into a big fucking bear. You've got you've got that covered, especially especially given certain f- given certain feet set up so you could possibly have a ba- a bear and still keep all- and still keep armor. Or just have ridiculous AC, so you're essentially a bit. They're so essentially tank. You're essentially a casting tank, or even worse, builds that would allow you to, ca- to allow you to cast while wild shaping. Yes. Early, because you could you would eventually naturally get a way to cast magic while wild shaped, mm-hmm. and during level up, this allowed you to do it at much earlier levels, and. At the earlier levels, where it's you know actually useful. Yeah, the cleric and the in the in the tier system, the cleric and the druid are right are right at the top because even un, even unoptimized, they're at, they're high on the food chain because of the fact that they can do so they can do so many roles so well. Effectively, they're enti- they can be entire parties all by themselves. The only problem there is they don't have enough meat shields to keep things off of them. And even then, that's not always true. Circle of friends, anybody? Well, I mean, the cl- it's debatable about which about which of the two is wor- which of the two is the bigger offender. But I'm of the mindset of I'll take them both. <laughs> yes. Which is worse, cleric or druid? Yes. Although I, I will ad- I will admit that the whole you cast divine sp- you cast divine spells, even th- even though you're drawing fr- even though you're drawing from the powers of nature was um, pants on head stupid. Uh, I think the reason for it was uh, 
because druids venerate nature as a divinity unto itself. Which, while true of druids in actual Celtic tribes in real life, in a in something like D and D, you 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 have deities of nature. If we're gonna be doing the whole Celtic tribes in real life, there needs to be a whole lot more human sacrifice. But you don't call druids killing anyone who comes into a forest a uh, sacrifice? Legitimately, except for the times that two of my friends have played have have had druids in their campaign settings, or myself in my campaign settings. Most of the DMs I've played under have played you if you walk into a druid protected forest, get ready to die. Um Implying that all druids are bloodthirsty assholes who just want to make sure everything that is not woodland critters and trees is dead. At least in their neck of the woods. So, uh, I'd, I'd call that ritual sacrifice. <laughs> Your blood will feed my trees quite well. Yep. But, um, the 5e, the 5e druid is, um, it's still a, it's still a healthy amount of bullshit, but it's slightly less bullshit compared to what came before. Um, I, I don't know if that's because of the changes to the druid or the changes to the to the uh, to the the system. I'm leaning more towards the changes to the system. Yeah, because now the now suppo supposedly they're like, see, we nerfed them. They no longer get animal companions, which doesn't mean a whole lot when you can wild shape into a bear at second level as a bonus action. And at third level, you can get an archetype that allows you to get animal companions back anyway. Yeah, so it's a kit once again, once again, with a lot of bad. You notice a lot of bad designers always bandage things rather than try and fix things. Yes, they jury rig. Looking at you, Paizo, I have no sympathy for the shit that you're currently in, because you brought this on yourself. But. The fact the fact that the the fact that um, the druid can perform multiple roles is is go is going to be at is going to be at the crux of the, of this kind of debate because of the because of the fact that when when you're dealing with a game with multiple players you want you want to make sure that everybody can contribute and um that's already that's already been made clear that that's a big that that's a big damn deal for the design of heavens and heresies. Which is what, which is why covering the druid in this case was going to be interesting, since, as is, the druid is a is a is a multi role character, and I I want and I and what I'm going to be looking forward to seeing through this is whether or not that is whether or not it's still very multi role or if its roles have been um, narrowed so that it isn't stepping on everyone else's toes. Basically, we're looking to see whether it's actually specialized now. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so, and and what I what I find especially interesting is that the is that the um the druid blurb <laughs> the druid blurb at the start is a dwarven druid. That's not a combination you see often. It's not. It's not really something you th see that often. That's true. <clears throat> as a druid of the moon, some might confuse me as an adherent of Lunaris. They are mistaken. The light of Lunaris may aid in the defining the creatures of Mirari, but I derive my power from the soul font itself, the source of all life. The most ancient of energies. Look around, experience the life which surrounds you. The joining of the soul and the material, that is what life is. I can see their connections, and more than others, I can attune to those connections. I can assume their shape. My circle is one of empathy, to truly feel what it means to be alive as another. I experience that firsthand. My form is malleable not due to arcane magics or eldritch understandings, but instead due to my full acceptance of the natural, the eternal. The soul font has chosen me as its guardian, and I intend to protect it. Yes, that is a that is a much better Scottish accent than the first time, but the barbarian that we were reading was one of madness, so the change in uh, accents was, was intentional. And secondly... 
Uh, there's no way I'm trying to affect this as both Scottish and feminine, because I imagine Idrissa Nightshade is a female druid. Mm-hmm. Anyways. <clears throat> so... Int so intuition is going to be is going to be the key ability when when do when using spells. And you and use. And it's it seems that's the only um that's the only ability requirement that they have. They are a, in a most of the time when you most of the time when we see um recommended ability scores we usually see one or two, um two as the standard. Rarely well, do you see. A one, a um, one ability um, recommendation. This uh, this leads me to wonder: Is this going to be a, a a trend for casters in general? Because the previous two classes have been martial, mm -hmm. and so they had strength slash dex and one other. This is just intuition, which I'm not gonna lie that that sounds pretty cool. Just having some intuition and and you can be a druid. Uh, you could choose probably another mental stat just for chits and giggles, and then probably one of the physical stats because you have to choose three, and it, you have to have at least one of each. Mm -hmm. Um, intuition makes sense too. You're 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 a uh, you're not re re you're you're not relying on thinking something through. It's more feeling through it. Mm-hmm. And you're not being a tenacious bastard either, so, I mean... You're not gutsing your way through it. <laughs> yep. And then then we have... We have the fact that proficient with light shields and standard shields. So, th so for those who want to... For, so, for those who want to have the... Wooden shield, a, a la um, white mages in Final Fantasy XIV. There you go. Um, simple proficiency with unarmed strikes and two subcategories of your choice. So you can have your kung fu druid if you want. <laughs> I'm looking forward to to seeing how you can splice in some uh, disciple feats to actually have your kung fu druid. <laughs> I'm gonna design. I'm gonna design a Mildred at this point. That is that is a druid with disciple feats. That's what I'm gonna do. <laughs> uh, let's see. Proficient in intuition and resolve. Proficient in nature, obviously, and two ritual artistries. I I would like to just note one more time. Uh, when we say proficient in intuition and resolve, we're talking about those defenses. Mm -hmm. Just uh, want to be we 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 get on Tanner about you know you might need some clarification there. I figure we should be just as precise. Uh, so then then we have the as a, then we have the whole thing with vitality, which uses intuition. Nice, um, and the, and increases by an additional two at fifth, eleventh, and seventeenth. Um, let me check if there was a sim if there was a similar rate when it came to um, a more physical one like the disciple. Um, no, th no, there, no, there isn't. Nope, because it was just half your level plus uh, resolve mod, and then you recover additional vitality according to your resolve mod with barbarian and disciple. Mm -hmm. Was the same with their intuition mod. So Druid actually gains more HP. Well, more more um, vitality. Yes, more vitality. Uh, more vitality, which is the the vital part of that whole health chain going from HP to vitality to willpower. Mm -hmm. um, that's interesting, actually. That that makes me wonder. Do we have a do we have a Dark Knight on our hands here? Is he going to spend from Vitality to do awesome shit? A druidic Dark Knight. That's, um... That's <laughs> an image. Cecil with an Ironwood sword. <laughs> Painted red just to be intimidating. I was going to say either... I was going to say either that or the... You know, the... When it comes to the whole... When it comes to the whole, um... You, wielding, a, wielding a wooden sword like that... 
Um, I can't really make that joke anymore because Shofu Khan exists. Okay. <laughs> if you don't know, uh, go watch Thunderbolt Fantasy, people. Uh, and anyway, stuff. and we get to the raising the death flag. When a druid raises the death flag, they are instantly restored to full HP. Their, vita their vitality and the vitality of their allies within 60 feet is restored to its maximum, including vitality lost by pushing forward. Their spells no longer require them to expend spell points. They make all attacks with advantage, and they may choose two additional secondary options for spells that they cast. These additional secondary options do not count against the total maximum they may channel into any one spell. Didn't we read something like that as, like... Just in the core mechanics at one point, that these two secondary ad additional options do not count against or it was it was it a class feature somewhere i forget which it was a class feature on the uh on the 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 um way of the shifting elements monk mm -hmm. um i like that this do you, do you know what this reminds me of since we've been talking about celts and druids and reviving your allies and doing magical feats that should uh that should be beyond mankind mm -hmm. do, do you want to know what terrible thing this reminds me of i'm afraid to ask but what highlander 2 ramirez lifting the giant blade thing with amazing grace playing in bagpipes in the background as he channels light out of his hand i hate you <laughs> i hate you for reminding me that highlander 2 still exists at least it's not. At least it's not something as bad as Endgame. Bitch, please, you can do worse than that. I could, but I'd rather not curse us both. <laughs> <laughs> I could curse us both with the one that has, that you can literally play yakety sax to. And anyway, <sighs> so, starting gear. Yep. So starting gear. Two weapons of your choice, or one weapon and one tier one shield, a spell focus, a tier one potion, and a tier one potion or poison of your choice. Now, uh, looking at the uh, the class table here, I'm not seeing a lot of features. It looks like everything comes from your archetype, except for the uh, 18th and 20th level abilities. Yeah, and um. Like and the and I'd say I'd say the bulk of what you're going to be getting is going to be coming from um, druidic aspects. Yeah. Which we'll probably we'll probably end up get we'll probably end up getting to that in a bit. Indeed. So first we have first we have spell casting. As a druid, you know a number of spells as shown on the druid spell casting table. There's an interesting note here. Uh, casters get to choose whatever spells they want. Certain spells aren't relegated to certain classes, really. But the spell system in Heavens and Heresies is very different. We kind of saw we kind of saw that when we went through the overview with that with those couple of spells that acted like their own little micro package instead of the old fire and forget. Yeah. Not to mention it's it's like uh, not only is it a micro package, but it's kind of like a build a spell. Mm -hmm. You know, on the fly, spend some points, get some additional pieces, build the spell, and then then you shoot it. Yep. So yeah. I'm guessing that the druid spell casting table might might have like the number of spells, and then maybe suggestions for what packages to take, or what packages might work best with your uh, with your class. Mm-hmm. And. When it, then, then we go into whenever you whenever you cast a spell, you're able to amplify the effects of that spell by choosing from one of its secondary effects without spending spell points. The secondary Ooh. effect limit chart on the druid spell casting table shows the maximum amount of secondary options you're able to channel into any one spell, so no no um spell point dumping. At, thir yep. at third level, you're able to amplify the spells you cast by spending spell points. You gain a number of spell points as shown on the spellcasting table. For each spell point you spend, 
you may choose one additional secondary effect for your spell. The maximum Probably, number... I, Go ahead. I was going to say that that's going to be capped by the maximum amount of secondary options mm -hmm. from the uh, from the table. Yep. The maximum number of spell points you may have at any given time is dependent on your level, and you gain all of your expended spell points after a rest. In addition, whenever you push forward, you regain a number of spell points depending on your level as well. The number of spell points you recover and your maximum spell points are shown on the Druid spellcasting table under the Recoverable Spell Point section and the Maximum Spell Point section, respectively. At 5th, 11th, and 17th level, you may choose one additional secondary option each time you cast a spell without spending spell points. And... So, yeah, the spellcasting table that we see just below it, mm -hmm. uh, it, it definitely it, it just defines, you know these limits and these these points so spells known uh is three up until ninth level where it is four for the rest of your career mm -hmm. uh, maximum spell points starts at two but eventually caps out at six um starting at 14th level goes to four at ninth level mm -hmm. and then recoverable spell points goes starts at one moves to 2 at 7th, moves to 3 at 13th, and at 20th it it goes to 4. Mm -hmm. But the secondary effect limit is crazy! <laughs> I'm sorry, 4 secondary effects at 7th level? Mm -hmm. And remember, at 5th, 11th, and 17th you get an additional secondary option that doesn't require spell points. So at 17th level, you which is where you get 7 secondary effect limit, you could apply four of them. One from the actual uh, spellcasting feature level one effect itself, and then three more from 5th, 11th, and 17th without spending spell points. So, and <laughs> because, because, of the way, because of the way options work, where you have a small list of essentially metamagic right out of the gate, um, even having just four spells to work with has a lot of versatility. And yeah. I think that's evidenced by the dev note here. Saying, the druid is set apart from the other casting classes in that they get more free secondary options for their spells, but have a lower ceiling for secondary options, have a lower number of maximum points, and recover less points when they push forward. They are, however, more consistent with their casting, and even spells they cast without adding spell points are relatively powerful. We're starting to see that specialization we were talking about already. Yeah, they um, they're not they they're not going to have a massive library of spells, but the few spells that they do have, they can do a fair a fair a fair amount of trickery with without um without burning into without burning into their pools. And on top of that, they are um, they are going to be uh consistent. They're not going to be spiky, but they're going to be very consistent in what they do. Mm -hmm. So then, the next thing that we have is Druid Claf, Dru Druid, ah, Druid Craft. You can speak the language. You can you learn the secret language of the of Druids. You can speak the language and use it to leave hidden messages. You and it's others. It's clear he doesn't speak the language. <laughs> you and uh, you and others who know this language automatically spot such a message. Others spot the mes message's presence with a successful intuition check against you your intuition defense, but can't decipher it without magic. While in a city or other form of, sip of cultivated space, you may always know the original terrain type over which the city was built. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure why you would need to know the terrain type. I'm interested to know why. Maybe it affects spell casting or features later on down the line. Let's see, then we have Druidic Aspects. You gain one druidic aspect of your choice. Your aspect options are detailed at the end of the class description. You must meet the requirements of an aspect in order to gain its benefits. When you gain a level in this class, you can choose one of the aspects you know and replace it with another aspect that you could learn at that level. When you gain certain druid levels, you gain additional aspects of your choice, as shown in the druidic aspects column of the druid class table. So what... 
So when it comes to the whole aspects thing, we're gonna have to save that for la for later. Yeah. I'm, I'm debating about whether or not we do that before or after we do um, archetypes. Um. If it's all the way at the end of the class description, I say we do it after we read off the basic features, but before we do the archetypes. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. Then we have then we have archetype, which is it works it works as you'd expect. Gain you gain a feature at second level and a, and again at sixth, tenth, and fourteenth. We also gain, and that's at second level. At second level, we also gain resplendent life, where you can allow allies within 15 feet of you to make use of your vitality as if it were their own. Now it makes sense why they get why they get more vitality for free. Because they there's, the, I was almost right about it being a dark knight. <laughs> almost. Instead, it's a shared vitality pool. Mm -hmm. But you know, that's still spending. You're still somehow magically spending from your from your life so i'm going to call that a technical correct the best kind of correct mm -hmm. let's see at fifth level you gain a spell casting feat as a bonus feat and you'll gain one another you'll gain another one at 11th and 17th level at 18th level you gain timeless body your fortitude and focus increase by two you suffer none of the drawbacks of old age and you can't be aged magically we saw that we saw that one on a on the uh, one of the the disciple archetypes too, or was it just on the disciple? I think it was an archetype specifically. I think it was the 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 perfect perfected soul. And the perfected soul, but but um, Kurt Hennig isn't here. <laughs> You're funny. I'm from Minnesota. I'm legally required to make that joke. <sighs> but what is legal is not always moral, Monk. I'll I'll remember I'll remember that the next the next time um next time we have next time we have Spider Man on bagpipes in a unicycle. <laughs> <laughs> uh, bagpipe unicycle characters. That's a blast from the past. Mm -hmm. And then finally, the 20th level feature, Archdruid. Yep. You may swap any of your aspects with different ones whenever you push forward or rest. I get the feeling that is going to be, that's going to result in some crazy shit. Mm-hmm. So that's something to keep in the back of our mind. When we cut, when we cover, um, when we cover the when we cover the aspects, which we are going to be doing right now, indeed. And there's um, there's a few of them. Um, we're prob should we go through all of them? <laughs> Especially since he plans on adding more. But um. Mm. Let's see. First of all, let's let's just remind everybody that at, at 20th level you'll have eight aspects to choose from. Mm -hmm. And what I see here is like 12. There's at least a good 25, maybe 30 aspects. I think it's 25-ish. So let's see what we got here. Aura of Life, plus one fortitude, and, and, that, and that extends to allies within 30 feet of you. Not bad. Bark skin. While you're not wearing armor, you gain DR equal to your intuition modifier, and your maximum hit points increase by your level. For perfect for those tanky druids. Um, blessing of formless wind you requires enter, you to be ninth level. Yep. You may enter a creature's space and stop there. You may also move through a space as ne as narrow as one inch wide without squeezing and let. And levitate a distance up to ten feet in the air. You may move so there's our, while levitating. There's our blood berserker and our um, uh, master of elements using water form. Mm -hmm. uh, Blessing of protective earth. You may burrow through non-magical, unworked earth and stone at a rate of one fourth your normal <laughs> movement. 
sorry, not one fourth, one half. While doing so, you do not disturb the material you move through. So, badger mole. Um. Yep. Blessing of Ravenous Fire. A creature that touches you or hits you with a melee attack takes 1d10 fire damage. In addition, you may enter a creature's space and stop there. The first time you enter a creature's space on that turn, that creature takes 1d10 fire damage. A creature may take fire damage from this feature no more than once per round. You also emit light akin to torchlight. So, flame on! <laughs> yeah, flame on! Um... Blessing of Sustaining Water. You may enter a creature's space and stop there. You may also move through a space as narrow as one inch wide without squeezing. In addition, your swim speed increases by 15 feet, and you may breathe underwater. So, you're Aqua Maria. <laughs> oh, that's a reference I don't think many people are going to get. If you... Well, in the... in in the in the in the words of a wise man google that fucker you should always just <laughs> google that fucker <laughs> um, child of the stream you are considered hidden when fully immersed within a natural water source combine that with the blessing of soothing water or sustaining water excuse me um, control water you learn the control water ritual and may cast it as an action and without paying its material cost Okay, so you are a waterbender. Control... I was about to say, wait, what? Control weather. You learn the control weather ritual and may cast it without paying its material cost. Oh, good. Aurora, oh, go. Aurora Monroe has entered the chat. Ba la 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 la. Ba la 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 la. Detect poison and disease. You may use your action to cast detect poison and disease ritual at will. You do not need to expend materials to cast it. Druidic Rejuvenation. You need to know Rejuvenation for this. When you use the Rejuvenation spell on an ally, you gain temporary hit points equal to two times the number of secondary options you chose for the spell. What? <laughs> and since you're going to be stacking secondary options as much as possible, that's Nice. Mm -hmm. Let's see, elemental infusion. You must, in order to in order to learn this, you must know either the fire, ice, poison, acid, lightning, wind slash water, or thunder spell. Once so basically, any of the elemental spells. Yep. Once per turn, when you channel one of the prerequisite spells through a weapon focus, you may increase your threat range with that attack by one. <laughs> That's nice. Um. Elemental Protection. Choose a damage type among the following. Fire, cold, acid, poison, or lightning. You gain resistance to the chosen damage type. If you already have resistance to the chosen element or gain resistance later, you gain immunity. You may change your choice after a rest. False Appearance. As long as you're surrounded by natural terrain, rocks, plants, trees, etc., you are indistinguishable from the surrounding terrain while you remain motionless, making you hidden three to other creatures. They can, of course, notice that a bush that was not there when they previously looked. This feature does not change your size. So by standing still, you become... You... <laughs> yeah, you, ha you, have you have natural camo. You don't even have Just... to strip... You don't even have to wear anything skin tight or strip butt naked to do it. My name is the Lorax. I speak for the trees. <laughs> Let's see. Locate creature. You learn the locate creature ritual and may cast it without paying material cost. Mantle of Autumn. When you are hindered, you may ignore two severity. When you are weakened, you may ignore three severity. Interesting. Let's see. Mantle of, Sp Mantle of Spring. When you are afflicted lightning, you may ignore two severity of the condition. You gain resistance to lightning damage. Mantle of summer. When you are inflicted fire, you may ignore two severity of the condition. You gain resistance to fire damage. Anyone feel like casting immolation on themselves? <laughs> Let's see. Mantle of winter. 
When you are afflicted cold, you may ignore too severity of the damage. You gain resistance to cold damage. Oh hey, it, oh hey, it's um, it's mid, it's Midwest and Canada simulator. Everybody's freezing their asses off, and we're like, it's not that cold, guys. Let's see, natural abundance. When you harvest mater when you harvest materials from a natural resource node rather than a fa rather than a fallen creature, you may harvest an additional material of the same quality and resonance. That's useful for rituals. Mm-hmm. Prime, I, especially. Go ahead. I was going to say probably, especially for any druidic artistries. Mm-hmm. Primal Awakening. You may perform the Awakened Ritual without paying its component cost. When you do so, the Awakened Beast or Plant is not charmed by you and re and retains its initial disposition toward you. Um, imagine doing pr imagine using pr Awakening on a goose. You just want to afflict everybody with a horrible goose. Honk. <laughs> Primal like I've, connection. I've um, I've, I've had, I've already told you that I have that I have my incidents with Canadian geese at work. Yes, yes, I know. Or but yesterday, uh, turkeys. Turkeys are stupid, though. Yeah, but a panic turkey is still is still a problem. I uh, hit it on the head, you'll be fine. <laughs> unfortunately, unfortunately, I don't have I don't have the means to just shoot just shoot the thing and have and have my turkey dinner for the next month. Mm, turkey sandwiches. Um, primal connection. <clears throat> your connection with nature allows you to expand the source of your magical abilities into the ground beneath you, summoning the natural energies around you. You may cast any spell with the range of melee on a target within 15 feet of you. <laughs> I'm going to cast Fist from 15 feet away. What? Punch with a giant clod of dirt. I'm... Rem what, I'm re what I'm instantly reminded of is... Especially when you mentioned that is... I remember that one of um, Iaiko's early summons in FF9... If you used it, the um, short version of the spell was just a giant fist <laughs> coming out of the ground. Yep. <clears throat> but, let's see, then we have Savagery. Your maximum vitality is reduced by one, but your threat range increases by one. Interesting gamble. Um... Speak with animals. You gain the speak with animals feat while affected by this aspect. Sylvan. Again, mm -hmm. my name is the Lorax. Mm -hmm. Sylvan speech. You may cast the speak with plants ritual without paying its material cost. See, I told you there was the Lorax. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Although, um, I'm not sure if I, I'm not sure if I take that because, well, you remember, you remember the, you remember having conversations with Ents. No. I was dead before they got the first word out. <laughs> Takes them all fucking day just to say good morning. You'd have to have a level 18 druid to talk to Ents. Mm -hmm. although, the, although the bigger question is, would you even want to? <laughs> no. Slash and burn, my friends. And... Let's see. Then, then we have um, Spirit of Rejuvenation. Allies within 30 feet of you are healed for two hit points for each vitality you expend to heal yourself while pushing forward. Again, the reason for the expanded vitality pool. Um, let's see. Sung from the Earth. Requires proficiency in forging. Now we know why it was a dwarven druid. <laughs> We all know we all know that dwarves go insane if there isn't a requisite requisite amount of beer or forges, or beards. Mm -hmm. uh, you may craft arms and armor without a facility as long as you are within nature. What? <laughs> I'm going to shape them from the very ore and the rock around me. 
K. I can't. I can't laugh too hard at the. I can't laugh too hard at the ridiculousness because I own a copy of Asunder. No, no, no. This isn't ridiculous, Monk. They've done something you've always wanted. Tanner has done something you've always wanted. He's made elves superfluous. <laughs> they, don't need to... they no longer sing things from the trees. The dwarves do. <laughs> Elf? <laughs> Fucking elf? No, you can't. F you can't forge your knife, you bastard! I'll show you forging! And then sings a bow from a tree and a sword from the. literally from the fucking stone, and goes, Now take him, you knife, you bastard, and kill what's in front of us! <laughs> and the elf goes, The fuck, man? Although, you wanna know what. you wanna know what would, what would make this kind of thing even worse? What? Combining. Combining, um, Sung from the Earth with, with let me, let me see, where, where, where was it? Come on. Man, I can just imagine how awkward Sung from the Earth would be with Sylvan speech, though. You're, you're singing a bow from the trees, and the tree goes, man, come on. Is this what they mean by taking a pound of flesh? Oh. <laughs> Ima imagine combining aspects of Song from the Earth with Primal Connection. I'm going to forge a sword that comes up to the ground and kills you. <laughs> Amen. I'm I, sorry, but I just have, sung, I just, from, sung from the earth makes me happy. I like that. Yeah, I just have I just have this mental image of a vine growing up from the earth, ta um, right bu right behind somebody, tapping them on the shoulder. They turn around, then they get smacked with a hammer. I can see that happening. We we would we would call it uh, I don't know, the singing hammer. Mm -hmm. Um, let's see. Then we have the thread of life and death. When a threatening creature within 30 feet of you dies, you may use your reaction to expend the, vi the vitality. If you do, you may heal yourself and your allies within 30 feet of you. The total amount of healing you may distribute is equal to your intuition modifier plus twice your fortitude. Wait. Wait. So, if a, if so if a creature that's threatening you is dead... You spend some of your extra vitality to heal everybody. Yeah. You hold on, hold on. You absorb and you absorb HP from dying enemies. You cast vitality. My Dark Knight comparison looks more and more and le more and more official and less and less technical. You want to know you want to know what makes this even better? And you pro you probably already saw this this image, but um, somebody did a bit of fan a bit of fan art of Frey from mm -hmm. um for FF14, the the guy who teaches you how to be a Dark Knight when you and then later you realize Frey was never there. Frey was dead all along. Um, somebody drew him holding an AK. I could see that. I'm maybe guessing... Frey was really maybe maybe the Frey was really just the Laguna we discovered along the way. <laughs> okay, that wasn't as that wasn't as far as I was gonna go. I was I was gonna say so. Is this the reason why we don't see Brandon Herrera playing Final Fantasy fourteen? I'll have to ask him. Well, that and he's probably too busy getting shot at in Tarkov. You know and. Dying, or um, fondling his uh, new Type One AK forty seven unnecessarily. Anyway, toes in the dirt. <laughs> Attacks made to move you or knock you prone are made with disadvantage. <sighs> We're going even further with this fucking dwarf and druid shit. I fucking told you. <laughs> the elves are. Fucking superfluous at this point. <sighs> um, and we have beast shapes. Hey, look! 
everybody! It's the thing druids are known for! When you adopt this, and it's got the most amount of text. When you adopt this aspect, you may expend a vitality and use your action to magically assume the shape of a beast. When you Form of an eagle! Yeah, it's like yeah, it's like the Wonder Twins, except you're not fucking useless. <laughs> when you transform into a beast, you can assume the shape of a wild animal. The appearance of the animal is up to you, but the creature of choice can cannot grant you any additional abilities beyond those listed below. For example, you may choose to transform into a bat rather than an eagle, but doing so would not grant you blind sight. When you transform into a beast, you may choose from the archetypes below. Each archetype grants you a specific bonus and allows you to assume a range of different sizes. You can stay in beast shape for a number of hours equal to half your druid level, rounded down. You then, you then revert to your normal form unless you expend another use of this feature. You can, reserve, you can revert to your normal form earlier by using a 10-foot quick action on your turn. You automatically revert if you fall unconscious, drop to zero hit points, or die, obviously. If you would transform into a creature that is smaller than tiny, you transform into a tiny size category version of that creature. Um, imagine doing this with transforming into, say, a um, ant. Or a cockroach. An, an ant the size of a, of a, of a cat? No, thank you. <laughs> Ants are annoying enough as it is. Oh. I'm just sitting... Or, e or even worse, a, um, what about a scorpion the size of a cat? We have those already. They're called lobsters. Yeah, but lobsters no. are delicious. Apparently so are scorpions. I've had neither. I probably will have neither. And anyways, while transformed, you may still speak, attack, and cast spells, but cannot perform any artistries. <laughs> Some habits die hard. Mm -hmm. We'll probably end up coming back to this later on when we do spells. <laughs> when you transform, your hit point maximum and total does not change, nor do your nor do your ability scores. If you are brought to zero hit points, you revert out of your beast form. You retain the benefit of any creatures from your class, ancestry, or other source, and can use them if the new form is physically capable of doing so. However, you can't use any tools or perform ability checks which would require human hands. And, fin oh. and finesse, like picking a lock, for example. Your equipment merges into your new form or changes shape to fit it. Worn equipment, including armor if you are wearing it, functions as normal, though the GM decides whether it is practical for the new form to wear a piece of equipment based on the creature's shape and size. And then we have the four archetypes. So, let's see, we have Beast of the Land, a wolf, increases well, your that's movement. Well, an that's just an example. Yeah. Increases your movement by <clears throat> 10 feet. Beast of the Trees, your climb feet increases by 15 feet. And its example is a spider. Mm -hmm. Beast of the Sea, your swim speed increases by 15 feet, and you may breathe underwater. And its example is Gargura. Sharks are <laughs> full of... Shark, sharks don't have that much protein, you know. <laughs> I loved how a discussion about the, nutri the nutritional value of, of sharks and ended up, ended up, make, ended up resulting... In the in the chat, trolling her, trolling her about whether or not she's fat. Yeah, <laughs> and she's not. No, I can tell you that right now. No, but she is small, and thus some um, the and thus the rules dictate that I bully the small. I mean, that's most people, though. Yeah, but it especially so. applies with us. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, let's see then, and beast of beast of the air. You gain a fly speed equal to your movement, and the example they gave is an eagle. Something I'd like to point out that is way way different from uh, wild shape in in other versions of a druid. 
When you transform, your hit point maximum and total does not change, nor do your ability scores. If you were brought to zero hit points, you revert out of your beast form. It used to be that your hit point maximum became the, the, the beasts, and then when you were brought to zero, you were just brought out of your beast form at whatever your HP was prior to shaping. I feel like this, appro I feel like this, is a pr this approach is a for-my-own-sanity kind of thing, because due to the whole wild shaping thing, Depending on how far you took wild shaping in um, D in D and D, um, you might have several other um, character sheets just for the extra profiles that you'd need for the different yeah. shapes. Whereas in this case, it's just okay, okay, we okay. Um, you're going you're going with one of these kind of archetypes. It's really up to you what you end up what you end up picking, but. You, but you're not in. You're not the actual version of that creature. It's just. A, it's just a disguise. Well, no, you you do shape shift into that creature. Yeah. But you retain all your own abilities and stats, and gain a small boon. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to. I'd like to point out that all of these are very utility based boons. Yeah. Util. I wouldn't. I wouldn't go so far as to call that to put them into the um, feet complaint that we had with with some of level ups exploration knacks. Yeah. No. It's it's not. It's it's. You do get a reduction in size if you choose a, an appropriately sized um, creature, mm -hmm. and you take the shape of that creature, which I I assume also means that if that if someone sees you as that creature and they're specifically looking for you, there's probably a condition of hidden at a, at a certain severity because of the fact that you're not, you don't look like you now. Um, because, I mean, if you're shape-shifted into an eagle and flying around and they're looking for a dwarf that was forging swords out of rock, uh, <laughs> I, I imagine that they're not going to look at the eagle and be like, there he is! Mm-hmm. I mean, obviously, that's probably going to be up to the GM to logically make that conclusion, but you know, it's it's you you gain some utilitarian boons that also make you useful in other ways. Yeah, although when it comes to the whole when it comes to the whole worn equipment thing, given the um, given the eagle form, once again, I have a terrible idea. Somebody, mm. somebody, um, somebody. Because it it's it says worn equipment, include including including armor. So imagine this: someone someone as a as a sneak attack on some on some helpless elves, who decided who decided to step into his forest. Um, Get off he, of my swamp! He he flies he um flies he flies at he flies at a at a cert, at a decent height. Let's say um. Let's say ten, let's say ten let's say ten feet up in the ten feet up in the air, right above right above, um, one of the elves. Immediately shape shifts immediately shifts back. Starts fa starts falling down and in and the meanwhile take and the meanwhile um unsheep meanwhile draws his warhammer and <laughs> and smashes down. Superhero landing, druid style. It's less of a superhero landing and more of a dynamic entry, or um, if I if I have to use a DFA ter if I have to use a um battle BattleTech term DFA, <laughs> or if we have to use a Warhammer term, uh, Deep Strike. Yep. And now that's bad. That's bad enough. But um, now imagine a now imagine um druidic soldiers. So you've got a dozen of them doing ambush tactics on. With this method, and why not? Uh, so all so you get so you've got so let's say in this situation the elves decide to come and they and they they see a druid and you go and they go, we have fit we have fit we have fifty uh, we have a we have a, small, we have a whole small we have a whole small there's a whole small company of of dwarves wait of dwarves wait of dwarves waiting in the wings isn't there it's like. Yeah, look up, <laughs> and and thus and thus we have the thus we have the dwarven deep strike maneuver. Hey, I mean it works. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm pretty I'm pretty sure that would technically count as attacking while fl against an enemy flat-footed. Depends on if they. 
It depends on if they weren't uh, weren't paying attention to, to the fact that there were way too many birds in the sky. Although, let, although let's be honest, if we were soundtracking that, you would total you would totally use um, "Ride of the Valkyries," wouldn't you? Um. Huh. Would I go with the stereotypical "Ride of the Valkyries," or would I look for something? Actually, no. Let no. me ra let me raise you one. Vorax Symphony. <laughs> no, no. I if if it's dwarves, and you have a dwarven deep strike, even though it's druids, um, it's gonna be the base drop for um. Oh, what was the song? Uh. was called ah yes okay the artist is hyper the song is spoiler it's the song that was used for all the trailers for cyberpunk 2077 the bass drop is when they all start dropping out of the sky <laughs> you're like why do i hear boss music <laughs> boom <laughs> I was gonna go with you i was gonna go with either that or the or one of, or the early sting from diggy diggy hole <laughs> oh, Yogg's cast. So that br that brings us to the archetypes, and there's only four of them, and one of them is still in development. Mm -hmm. So the first one we have is Circle of the Land. Nature is power. From the lightning-filled tempest to the serene wood, there is magic in all things. A druid of the land understands this. They form both the land and its magic to their will, intertwining and manipulating both to their own ends. So first, and this we... is where, <laughs> good. This is where that aspect of druid craft, where you can always identify the original terrain type, mm -hmm. is going to come into play. Yep. So much, so much, so much for that. Um, Chekhov's gun jamming. Oh, I didn't think it was going to jam. Tanner has pulled that trigger every fucking time. Well, it's ta it's his name's Tanner, not Tommy Gun. <laughs> so for, first we have terrain attunement. For each secondary option you channel into a spell, you can apply an additional bonus based on the terrain type around you. The effects are additive, meaning if you channel two secondary effects, you gain the appro you gain the effect of the appropriate bonus twice, to a maximum of four of the same bonus. If you're standing in a city or similar type of cultivated space, you gain the benefits of the terrain type over which the city was built. So let's see what terrain types we have. Cavern. You and you and cre you and ev and creatures of your choice within ten feet become hidden one until the beginning of your next turn. Desert tundra. You may increase the range of your non melee spells by ten feet. Forest forest or jungle. You and conscious creatures of your choice within 10 feet of you gain 2 temporary HP. Grassland or Plains. You may remove 1 severity of the afflicted, weakened, vulnerable, or stunned condition from yourself or a creature within within 10 feet of you. Hill, mount, hill or Mountain. You and creatures of, the, of your choice within 10, within 10 feet of you gain 1 damage reduction at until the beginning of your next turn. Swamp and Marsh. Your movement and the movement of creatures of your choice within 10 feet of you increases by 5 feet until the beginning of your next turn. Um, and underwater and coastal. Mm -hmm. Your swim speed and the swim speed of creatures of your choice within 10 feet of you increases by 5 feet until the beginning of the next turn. And there's a note saying something else needs to be here in case they're just on the coast and not, and not in the water. So that's probably going to be revamped a little bit. Mm -hmm. Um... I, I have a point of clarification, especially ha after having read Disciple in one of their archetypes. The hidden condition given to you by Cavern, is that a condition that technically counts as darkness for the purposes of uh, of the Disciple that, um, of Shadows? I, I'm guessing it probably does not. This just seems like you're hidden. Mm -hmm. But if it's technically making a phantom cavern over you, which is what makes you hidden, it could 
technically count. I so, get the feeling that's going to be one of those GM's going to GM's going to call it at the table kind of things. Yeah, likely. I just, you know me, I I try to think of all the angles. Mm -hmm. So at sixth level, you gain land stride. You may ignore four severity of hindering terrain. So you prob you probably could do the um, do the do the old walk do the old walk on walk on hot coals thing without without having to train. What are you talking and about? Sixth level is training. Or, or bar barring that, um, you could do the embodiment of the dwarven parenting meme. It's sink or <laughs> swim, boy. Dad, this is hot lava. Sounds like elf talk to me, boy. Let's see. At sixth level, you also gain primal invigoration. When you cast a spell, you may expend a vitality and choose an, an additional secondary option for that spell. Doing so does not count against the total number of secondary effects you can channel into one spell. Only a single vitality can be expended in your way in this way for each spell that you cast. <laughs> as if they didn't have enough spell options as it is. This allows you to break your upper limit. Yeah. I mean, you have to spend to do so. And you can only do it with one extra vitality. Mm -hmm. Also, again, spending from vitality. Um, Dark Knight's looking real likely now. A, dar a Dark Knight Dwarven Druid. Make a Druid of the land. With some of the really cool... Oh, I apologize. That is my phone going off because of an Amber Alert. It's going to do it again, too. I almost guarantee it. Mm. But you, uh... You create a, uh... Druid... Dwarven Druid with a... Circle of the land. Stupid thing. Uh... And then you throw in some berserker feats too. Throw in some 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 of the some of the feats from from our uh, our trusty friend guts, mm -hmm. the barbarian. Then you really do have a dark knight going. <laughs> All that spending from HP and being tenacious. Is that what guts would have ended up doing if he actually kept the axe? I don't think so. Yeah, probably not. Um, let's see. Then we ha at tenth level, you get Nature's Ward. You gain immunity to all common, uncommon, and rare diseases, and do not suffer any of the effects of the afflicted poison or the afflicted acid conditions, except for the damage they deal. When you use your Primal Invigoration feature, you can also change. Change the earth on which you stand from one type of land to another, granting you the benefits of that terrain's attunement. Doing so affects the land within 10 feet of you. Using this feature within a city or another type of cultivated space grant, grants you the benefits of the changed terrain types, but does not otherwise alter the space around you. This means I'm that you could, you could turn a forest into <laughs> underwater. Or make new mountains everywhere because you're a fucking dwarf. <laughs> no more trees now, Nifir. <laughs> Only mountains. Let's see, and at 14th level, you gain Nature's Sanctuary. You gain a damage threshold equal to your intuition score and bonus vitality equal to twice your intuition modifier rather than your intuition modifier. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, so, next we, ha next we have Circle of the Moon. Like the ferocious werebeasts of Mirari, druids of the moon are able to change their shape and size. Unlike druids of the land, who attune themselves 
to the terrain on which they stand, druids of the moon attuned to the beasts of Mirari, imitating their form and power. So first we have the shape of the moon. Channeling the primal energy around you, you are able to change your form and resemble a primal beast of your choosing. A druid of the moon can only choose the way they embody these beasts. Some transform into a hybridized form of human and beast, while others more truly embody the shape of the beast themselves. You retain all your features and abilities, including your ability to speak and cast spells when you transform. Once per turn, you may utilize a quick action, a five-foot quick action, in order to expend a number of vitality equal to half your level, rounded up, minimum minimum one, and cannot expend more than eight, in order to tra transform into one of the following options. These options are provided as guidelines in terms of flavor, meant to represent the four main primal beasts. If you'd like to choose a different beast for the purpose of flavor, you're able to do so with GM approval. Your transformation lasts for an, for a duration for the duration of an encounter or one minute. When you transform and for the duration of your transformation, you may also assume a new category, choosing either small, medium, or large. <coughs> Let's see, we have Form of the Bear. You gain damage reduction equal to the number of vitality you expended and temporary hit points equal to your intuition. Modifier times the number of vitality you expended to transform. Form of the Panther. Once per round, when you channel a spell through a weapon attack, you may deal an additional amount of damage equal to the number of vitality you expended to transform times the number of secondary options channeled into the spell. <laughs> Combine that with our ranged melee shit from earlier. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, form of the Wolf. You and allies within 60 feet of you gain 5 feet of bonus movement. For every vitality you expended when you transformed. In addition, the threat range of allies within 10 feet of you increases by 1, regardless of the vitality expended, which is a smart move because you don't want somebody to dump this so that they can crit fish. Let's see. You also gain primal affinity, so you regain additional vitality equal to your intuition modifier whenever you push forward. At 6th level, you gain Aspect of the Beast. You can choose two additional aspects and get and gain their benefits. So now you can have a maximum of 10 as a circle of the moon, or, or as a, yeah, sh a shape of the moon, circle of the moon person. Mm -hmm. um, at 10th level, you gain Course of the Changing Moon. You gain the following benefits while in each form. For, be for Bear... The enemies cannot crit against you, and attacks that target your strength or constitution defense are made with disadvantage. For Panther, once per round when you channel a spell through a melee weapon, you can impose two severity of the afflicted physical condition for each secondary option channeled into the spell. Which means if you've channeled in quite a few secondary options, they're going to get, like, physical eight. Not to mention this is... Not to mention you're going to be... Ch even even without spending spell points, you're going to be channeling um, secondary options. Mm-hmm. Um, wolf, you attune further to the wolf and its pack, granting your allies the ability to quickly tear down a foe. If an enemy within melee reach of you would take damage from an ally's attack, it takes two additional damage. This damage is added in after any damage resistance or damage reduction has been applied. Hmm. And at 14th level, you gain Form of the Twinned Moons. You may assume two forms rather than one whenever you transform. When you do so, you do not need to expend vitality for each form, but you must choose one to be your greater form and another to be your lesser form. You do not gain the features granted to you from the Course of the Changing Moon for your lesser form, but otherwise gain all the benefits ascribed to either form. So, when you choose your lesser form, it means that... <coughs> You don't get the level 10 feature for that lesser form, but that's really it. Mm -hmm. That can lead to some interesting combinations. Let's see, and then we have... Circle of the Veil. The Veil separates all things. Life, death, nature, civilization. Each of these are the faces of a coin, and the Veil is the material between them. 
A druid of the Circle of the Veil vale understands this liminal area, the place between places, and is able to channel that space in order to find the truth about all things. They see as other creatures cannot. So the first, the first that they get is the Veil vale of Life and Death. You learn either the Rejuvenation spell or the Wither spell. If you know both spells, you may instead learn a spell of your choice. When a threatening creature within 30 feet of you dies, you may use your reaction and cause one, one ally within 30 feet of you to gain one vitality. Then we have, we also have Child of the Veil. Vale. You gain proficiency in the divination artistry. If you already have proficiency in this artistry, you may gain this proficiency in a different artistry of your choice. Although, um, with some of with some of these, I feel like the druid is get is leaning a little bit um necromancy. Hmm. Well, I mean, life and death are all parts of nature. Yep. Also, um, Tanner, I have a question for you. Uh, have you have you fallen down the rabbit hole? If so, fauna or mume, who is your favorite? <laughs> the fact that he mentions the two of those paired that that we'll leave it we'll leave it there and ever, anybody else who knows what i'm talking about we are all people of culture here mm. so um so i like the fact that this is all about life and death that's actually really cool. Mm -hmm. And at sixth level, you gain liminality. I think I still have my I think I still have my OVA DVDs of that. Um, Dot hack liminality. Mm -hmm. I still have them. Yeah. Yep. On your turn, you may teleport to a space you can see as a quick action. The quick action costs an amount of movement equal to the distance you wish to teleport. You can also use this feature to teleport someone else. You may teleport a willing ally within 10 feet of you to a space you can see as a quick action. The quick action costs an amount of movement equal to the distance you wish to teleport. What? Teleporting druids? <laughs> this is even better than the deep strike! This is way better than the deep strike. We no, have, you do them both. You do have, them both. <laughs> we have druid ninjas. This isn't even ninjas. This is just druids teleporting in the middle of your shit. Mm -hmm. They're like, hi. Or even better, hello there. <laughs> Obligatory. Yep. Um, at 10th level, you gain the true nature of things. You may expend a vitality t in order to perform a tier 1 or 2 divination ritual without providing the ritual's material cost, and you increase your intuition score by 2. That's nice. And then um, at 14th level, you gain the illusion of space and time. Oh, is this that... Oh, do we become Buddha Bubba? You know, Mr. <laughs> time is an illusion from, from Atla. <laughs> Your movement increases by 10 feet. If you and your allies would be outnumbered in an encounter, you may choose one ally to act twice each round. This ally takes another turn in the encounter each round, gaining another action and movement. It does not gain any additional reactions in the round. For the purposes of determining the number of allies, do not count those who are unconscious, though unconscious allies must still take their turn. Increase all of your mental ability scores by 2. Man, the veil not only gives you all this divination, life, and death stuff, but it really pumps your mental ability scores, which means you're going to be a big spell slinger with this one. Yeah, although um, with that with that teleporting stuff and additional movement, especially given given numbs, um, given certain um, um, I know what shapes. I know what these druids are. I know what these druids are. Surprise, motherfucker. No. It's an old name. One that some people cursed and others thought were blessed. 
whiz robes. <laughs> but now, unfortunately, I, I did say that now I did say that that um that there were four. There's technically only three because the last one, um, Circle of the Depths, is currently unfinished. And he put in he put in a death note saying. This probably won't be called Circle of the Depths once I'm finished with it. Once I get a firmer grasp on the companion mechanics, I'll input this archetype. For now, I can't write anything until those mechanics are settled into the core of the game, rather than being an amalgamation of completely separate mechanics, which might as well be their own game that they can current that they currently are. This will be a pet druid archetype. It might focus on minions, or it might focus on a larger pet. Or more probably, it will take the option between the two. Update. I have been recently putting a lot of work into these mechanics, but they are not yet finished. This archetype will be available soon. Its main mechanics include treating your pet as your own weapon, meaning you can channel spells, secondary effects through it, sharing your own aspects with those of your pet, and others. It'd be funny, it'd be funny as hell if that meant that you could wild shape your pet. It's likely more that uh, you could only share druidic aspects that would make sense. I don't, I don't know. Have, I don't know. Having a having a pet squirrel that all of a sudden all of a sudden turns into a big ass bear is amusing to me. Yeah, but then that's a big ass bear with only like two HP. Oh, fair, fair enough. So, um, go ahead. <laughs> When it comes to when it comes to the circle of the the circle of the depths, obviously there's not there's not a whole lot we can go, we can go over yet. Um, if down the line while we're doing this series, the cir the circle of the depths or whatever or whatever its um whatever its name is when the time comes does get does get um added in, we'll go we'll give it a once over. Mm-hmm. But I want I want to I want to take this time to call back to um to what we dis to what we discussed earlier on. So at the when we started this out, we had mentioned that uh, that our major problem with with mm -hmm. um druids in van in um vanilla D and D. Is the f is the fact that they end up do it? They end up being able to do too many roles at once, and do them better than some people who are supposed to be focused on those roles. Mm -hmm. And I know some people. I know some people will say, "But they can't do skills." There's there's already spells to work around that. There's always been spells to work around that. Yeah, that's one of those things I hate. But. When it but when it comes to this one, I did notice a bit of a pattern that a lot of that, a lot of their features aren't all aren't all that direct. Compared no, to most speaking. of the, most of their features seem very uh, utilitarian. Ba very utilitarian or um, back row. Yeah, it's not saying you can't have a frontline druid, but to, but. The druid seems to be leaning more into 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 um support, and and the whole a lot from a little, especially given the fact that they're not going to be they're not going to be swimming in spell slots. But they are going to be swimming in secondary effects. Mm -hmm. God, there's a. <clears throat> I say, I say that the specialization we see here, even with all the archetypes. Is that these the druids are magic tinkerers? They play around with the with the fabric of magic more than any other type. While this means that they don't have necessarily the same depth of knowledge into a single area, which would manifest as m more spells known, it does mean that they know how to apply more permutations to a single spell than anybody else, which manifests as their higher uh, maximum secondary spell count. Or secondary spell effect account. Mm -hmm. um, on top of that, 
I really like. Uh, I'm not gonna lie. Uh, Druid of the Veil, Circle of the Veil, totally my sort of thing. I have the ability to do life and death stuff, teleport you, and see the future. That's so cool. And again, Tanner, Fauna, or Mume. Your answer is a. Uh, your answer tells me what your culture status is. You're you're a man of culture, no matter what. But uh, there let me are just say degrees of culture. There are degrees of culture, and uh, let me just say, crony, um, trumps all. Just saying. Best girl. <laughs> but that that being said, the th the um, what I do now, obvious obviously, um, given the, given the fact that unless I'm mistaken. I don't think I don't think that there I don't think that there is a um there is a specific spell list for each of the casting classes. Mm -hmm. And I'm I'm looking in I'm looking in that section and no, it doesn't I'm not seeing it's I'm not seeing it so far. It just ha you have you have the whole thing when it comes to actually casting the spells. But in ter but in terms of, actually, no, there there really isn't. It's not like it's not like say the five E approach where every every casting class has their own spell list. Well, he, he did say that you know there wasn't really going to be any spells restricted from any classes. Yeah, and we're de we're definitely seeing that. Yep. And I'd say I'd say the uh, I'd say some I'd say the other th the other thing is the is the fact that while um I know I know I ra I know I railed on um on dr on um D and D druids being able to spell cast and um wild shape and while that's certainly present here. It doesn't piss me off as much. It's because of the fact that their wild shape doesn't uh, doesn't it isn't so overpowered as it is in, in base. There is there is that, but I think I think the other reason is the is the fact that um the amount the amount of the amount of the amount of variety of effects when it comes to the spells that they can actually cast is going to, is going to be somewhat limited by their by their um low spell count. Yeah, but it's all about what all about doing what you can with the tools you have. Mm -hmm. I like that idea, and that cer that certainly would be very um, druidy. Um, although when it com although um, when it comes, I do like that with that with each with each entry we seem to have memed a character into existence. <laughs> <laughs> and this week was no exception. With, what with our, what what with our dwar our dwarven, <laughs> our dwarven fo um, forge from the forge things from the land dr druid who will who will occasionally do ninja will occasionally do um, dive bo dive bomb attacks on unsuspecting elves because he hates al he hates all races in his forest, but he especially hates elves. Knife your pricks that better get out. Like I said, Monk, he fulfilled your dream. He made elves superfluous. <laughs> he probably does. He probably does. He probably is ambivalent towards humans. They're just, just um, well, because they because they're smart enough to actually leave him alone. Or they only approach him when they need something truly helpful from the druid guy. Mm -hmm. Is. Oh, the, hum I, the humans are all off in the all off in their fancy schmancy cities. I'm not deal He's not dealing with any of that shit. Oi, druid! I'm here to pay you for a divination. On what have you got for me that isn't your cold gold? I've got these pretty seashells I picked up from the ocean three thousand miles away. Now let me see those. <laughs> oh, this one's nice. How many have you got? Takes out like seven bags. <laughs> <laughs> Too many of these are broken, but there's enough here. Okay, I'll get your divination. 
and then you'll get the hell out of my fucking forest. <laughs> Paying the druid in seashells. Hey. But that's only if he lives in the forest. If mm -hmm. he lives on the sea, pay him in sticks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you didn't get any of these sticks from those knife ears, did you? No, I picked them up off the ground. Good. If you got them from a knife ear, I'd have to shiv you. But you're a druid. Doesn't mean I can I make a shiv! <laughs> <laughs> I... <laughs> If I could draw, I would want to draw all this. <laughs> but I, sadly, I cannot draw. No. And um, draw, drawing a drawing a full co drawing a full comic in that regard is a little is a little bit out of my pay grade. But I'd say now, ob obviously, when it comes to the offensive capability of that druid, it's of this um, particular druid, it's going to depend on their choice of spells. Yep, but what I, vary. what I don't but what I can see out of this is that there is a good amount of variety, but it's not a case of of you can do everything really well. Even with all even with all the stuff with um with terrain magic, with sh with shaping and all and 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 with regular casting. Mm. The, you you have so you have several roads that you can take. But at the end of the day, you're going to take one more than everything else. Yeah. And because of, because of that, that's the kind of variety that that I that I prefer. You've got a lot. You've got a lot of potential roads, but at the at the end of the day, you're gonna you're gonna be finding a niche and you're gonna be relatively sticking to it. Crazy ass builds, notwithstanding, which will which we already see, we already saw a little bit, and ended up creating by accident with this um, particular setup. <laughs> and to think, originally you thought that the character you're gonna meme into existence was gonna be a kung fu du druid. I might still do that. Um, we'll see. We'll see which ca which character classes seems like the best way to meme you into existence. Um. It's tempt. It it'd be tempting to it'd be it'd be tempting to say disciple, but I get the feeling that would be a little too obvious. I'm going to laugh if we get to paladin or cleric or their equivalencies. Um. That uh. That um. If they fit, and you can just stick a few disciple stuff on top of it. And make a kung fu priest, or a kung fu monastic brother, um, who play who 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 has proficiency in gaming dice. <laughs> hey, although the the former example you gave wouldn't wouldn't that wouldn't you just end up making me a Taoist priest? Hmm. Maybe. Although, tr although truth be told, there are plenty of examples throughout history of um, of monks who are also priests. Mm-hmm. Mostly because you have to be properly ordained when it comes to when it comes to certain rituals. Yes. Um. Could always make you a Dudist priest, but that's as easy as getting the certificate online. Eh, you you don't do that kind of easy. I am a Dudist priest. I'm ordained. <laughs> but let's let me see let me see what's gonna be what's gonna be next on what's gonna be next on the docket because we end, we end up going we end up going relatively quick on this one. So next. Oh, next one! Next one's gonna be fun. It's it's D and D. It's D and D's favorite whipping boy, of of gimping in the in the name of my balance. It's the, the feeder. Yeah. So, so next week I get I get to once again I get to once again rant about how fi about how fighters are disrespected in D and D. Because they are, and anybody who questions that, you might want to look long into your own soul and wonder why wonder who hurt you 
and why their name is Wizards of the Coast. Or T or fuck it, even T even TSR isn't immune. <laughs> In the end, um, my final impressions of the Druid, even though the class is technically incomplete without that last archetype, is that it's going to be... It still has the... Um, like you said, it still has the same... It can branch out in multi-role basis. It's there. You can see that DNA. Mm-hmm. But it encourages taking one branch to its logical extreme. Whether you want to be the beastie supporter, or you want to be Mr. I can see the future and teleport everybody everywhere, or whether you want to literally make the earth your bitch, um, every one of the archetypes has a really great feel to it. It's all, it, Each one does something distinct and different. There's really no overlap between the three that are available. Mm -hmm. uh, on, on top of that, the druidic... Uh, the druidic aspects remind me a lot of... Um, of the, the, uh, the warlock invocations. It feels like the same, the same type of thing. But it's really, really well done. And there's not, you know, feet chains like there required feet chains and required invocation changes like there are with the warlock and base yeah. fighty. There's, there's some degree of chaining, but not much. Well, none of the none of the druidic aspects chain into each other. Mm -hmm. Is the thing. It's just you have to have either a spell or a level to qualify for some of the aspects. And in the case of spell, that's a ma that is a massive. Um, investment. Yes, because you only get four at ma at maximum level. But for example, um, spirit or uh, not spirit of rejuvenation? Where is it? The D druidic rejuvenation. The druidic aspect that says you have to know the rejuvenation spell. Mm -hmm. If you're playing a uh, a druid of uh, from the circle of the void or veil, excuse me, mm -hmm. circle of the veil. Um, you can get the rejuvenation spell for free outside of your four, your three to four normal spells. Mm -hmm. Because I assume that any spell given to you by these features is a spell outside of what's on the druid spellcasting table. It's it's extra, and maybe that needs to be clarified. But I'm pretty sure that that's almost assumed at that point, since it's a feature rather than something you're picking as part of. The spellcasting table. Yep. Uh, but you know me again. Future proofing, avoiding law rules, lawyers being assholes, etc., um, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. My yeah. normal excuses for the clarification, Tanner. We want to avoid the assholes from assholing up the tables. <laughs> but uh, the the. Most of the prerequisites are just you have to know you have to you have to you have to be at a specific level. Mm -hmm. You know, beast shape is second level. Uh, locate creature seventh. It's only I think three aspects total that require something different. Uh, yeah, druidic re rejuvenation requires you know rejuvenation. Elemental infusion requires you know an elemental spell. Mm -hmm. And then sung from the earth requires proficiency in fourteen. That's it. Two, two are spell prerequisites. One is a, a proficiency prerequisite, which if you're playing a dwarfy, a dwarfy druid, you kind of probably have proficiency in forging just because. Yeah. Um, I'd like to... I, and I, I know that there's plans to expand the amount of aspects. I hope that other skills are, cov are covered in that, in that whole... You can, you can, cra you can craft without, without need, with just the land itself. Could you imagine being able to craft your own potions and poisons if you're just out in the land? Yes. I would love that. It would also it would also make things a hell of a lot a hell of a lot easier. 
And I'd, I'd imagine that when it comes to crafting potions and poisons, um, that's probably not going to be on the list because of, because of all the questions it raises. You're just playing Skyrim and you're eating everything as you go. <laughs> And at least, at least in this case, because we're not using the creation engine, it does actually work. <laughs> uh, it just works. It just works, little. <laughs> People buy money, gross. It just... <laughs> I can't sing it while laughing, monkey. You know, some people seem to think that some people seem to have the impression that I just that I just hopped on a bandwagon when it came to picking on Skyrim. This is not true. I've been picking on the Elder Scrolls for for over a decade. I'd been picking on the Elder Scrolls since Oblivion. Well, I've been picking on the Elder Scrolls since Daggerfall. Same. Even though Daggerfall is a pretty good game, but you know, Rails. Um... Mm -hmm. But with I think I think that's as I think that's as good of a capstone as any. So, like I said, next week we'll be looking at the fighter. Expect to hear me. Expect to hear me yell about the about the caster non caster discrepancy, again. Linear fighters, quadratic wizards. Look, if you don't, if you want me to stop bitching about this discrepancy, stop putting it in your fucking games, people. It's really that simple. This ain't rocket science. But with all that said. Once again, a, once again, a sincere thanks to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody. <laughs>